let me say welcome to all of our participants uh, who are showing up for our weekly serious security seminar. Uh, we've been holding this on a weekly basis since the early 1990s and uh, recording it for nearly 20 years. Uh, we've had quite a collection of speakers, but this is the first time that uh, Wynn Schwerta has been uh, here to grace us with uh, his ideas and his presence. Um, all of these talks are recorded and they're available through the series website. So you can uh, go back through time and listen to a lot of other speakers, or you can replay this one again and again. Um, Wynn is well known in the security community for uh, a lot of innovative thinking. Um, and I think that's in part because he didn't really have a background in computing. Uh, he approaches this from a different perspective. And as a result, he's been able to discuss issues of things like information warfare, cyber warfare, uh, but particularly some very interesting ideas about uh, analog security and time-based security. And uh, we're looking forward to hearing Wynn's comments today. So uh, during his talk, if you have questions, please post them in the Q&A and uh, we'll select from those to answer as we go along. So without further ado, uh, the wonderful Mr. Schwartop, please. Oh, Spav, thank you. Thank you all very much uh, for coming. What day? I don't even know what day this is. What day is this? What month? Somewhere. All right. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, my job over the next uh, few minutes is to uh, mess with your minds a little bit and hopefully just get you to think a little bit differently about approaches to security. Uh, as Spaff said, um, I grew up differently, and I'll, I'll show you a little bit of that. And I, I think about things uh, differently than a lot of people. So what I'm going to be talking about uh, is meant to hopefully help us reevaluate where we're going in security and perhaps get rid of uh, some of the old biases that we've had for so many years. So uh, I have a bunch of axioms that I like to use. Feel free to read through them at a, at a later time. But a uh, couple of the really important ones are about infinity. And we're gonna get into the concept of infinity of uh, why things have been failing, why security mechanisms aren't working. And it ends up being fundamentally a, a, a conceptual design, a framework that I argue uh, we need to improve upon. Now, Spaff mentioned that I come from a slightly different world, and uh, I do. Uh, I grew up a, an engineer uh, without a degree, so nothing there uh, at all. I was a hands-on engineer. My mother was the first audio engineer at NBC during World War II and had uh, went to the University of Michigan and all the broadcast stuff, such as the tech was back then. My father uh, worked on radar development in the Pacific during World War II. And then over on the right, I started a TV repair business at the age of five because I was able to change tubes and charge 50 cents for every TV I fix. And so the world I grew up in was very different down at the lower left there. That's how we built stuff back in the day. You had to go in there and sort through resistors and capacitors and tubes and sockets in order to make things work. And so it was a whole different kind of DIY world back there. And in the lower right, that was the first computer uh, I actually ever built. And that was an analog computer, which uh, uh, didn't really mean anything much to me at the time, but did many, many years later. So after my TV repair career, um, I ended up in the music business. and. I, it was just something that happened. I, I, have a, I can think in systems. And so in the middle up there, that is a mechanical uh, electronic, if you want to call it cyber kinetic uh, lathe, which is how we used to cut records to make vinyl. On the left is a recording studio that I helped build. And I started working there when I was 16. Down at the bottom was another one. And over on the right, uh, I got to work at Electric Lady with Hendrix and Robert Margulov on some of the early Moog stuff. And this was all really systems. 
where you had to kind of have a picture of everything that was going on to be able to either make it work or in many cases fix it, uh, especially in a live situation, which is where I spent a lot of uh, many years in that portion of my career. So I want to look at uh, this from a slightly different approach and start talking about probabilistic versus deterministic views. And uh, we can go to physics and in the classical Newtonian sense, everything is highly deterministic. Uh, the, the pool ball uh, metaphor works very, very well. And Newtonian mechanics works very, very well determini deterministically uh, at certain scales. And generally they say macro scales. But when we start going down to the quantum world, everything is suddenly very probabilistic, non-deterministic, and we end up with some very counterintuitive and counter uh, physics uh, mechanisms that occur from time to time down in the quantum foam. And those include very momentary uh, isolated cases of time travel, anti-entropic behavior that will occur. They occur at that level, but are not going to surface up into the macro level. But the principle is that we are thinking more and more and more in physics at the pure probabilistic level of all behavior in the universe. In the quantum world, quantum is fundamentally probabilistic as well. And the problem that we have, obviously, is uh, temperature control and the massive amount of errors that uh, are in native to this technology because of external influence, noise, heat, temperature, all of those kinds of uh, thermodynamic conditions that mess up the quantum operations and make them uh, less than reliable. One of the things to keep in mind is that when we're talking about quantum computing being probabilistic, and we're going to see this in neural networks, is that very often, uh, because of the way they operate, you ask a question, give it some input, and you expect some in a deterministic mindset and output of a given answer. But in a, many of the worlds we're going to be talking about, that's just not true. You're going to get potentially different answers over a period of time as the nature of the network that's making the decisions, the computer, if you will, uh, evolves over time. Now, Purdue has been, I spelled it right there for you, Spaff. Uh, Purdue has been involved in probabilistic computing, trying to overcome some of the native problems that quantum computing has. And again, it's all prob uh, probabilistic and the math is pretty well known. However, in this case, uh, it, what they're working on with, and I forget the name of the Japanese uh, organization that you're researching with, that they can operate at room temperature and they're scalable. And because of that and the way that they work, you can have two to three order magnitudes less computing power required for a given operation. Now, this is not a replacement for quantum computing, but it's an interim step that has been found to be able to solve a certain subclass of quantum computing problems taking this approach. And again, we're back into the probabilistic world. Brain, probabilistic, uh, forgotten memories, uh, influenced memories, the feedback mechanisms that occur. It's all about the brain doing averaging and weighting and looking at input conditions and coming up with some sort of polled answer, some sort of weighted answer that is going to be probabilistically maybe. Uh, it's going to be the best guess. And that's just the way the brain works. Uh, it is much more of a stochastic kind of processing than traditional uh, computers, and that's just part of the problems that we've had. If you've had a, a, a chance to read Jeff Hawkins' work on the thousand uh, brain uh, model that we have in our heads, as according to him, it becomes exceedingly interesting when we have 150,000, roughly, parallel computing, neural computing elements in our neocortex. So everything around us is going probabilistic. And when we look at neural networks, it's about waiting, it's about averaging, it's about coming up with some of the initial best guess and then letting, whether it's uh, self-training uh, with data sets, training without data sets, whether, no matter which way we go, there are still gonna be answers that are not gonna be perfect at all. And this is what makes it probabilistic. So in deep learning uh, with convolutional neural networks, it's all about hidden layers, averaging feedback mechanisms, and coming up with the best 
guess. And we see a lot of the errors that are occurring in uh, facial recognition is one that has been a bitch and it still is. And so in some cases, these things work exceedingly well when you're looking for patterns and an unknown answer and looking for insights with data and statistical analysis. But when it comes to absolute one and zero binary conditions, no. And so I'm arguing against insecurity having strict binary conditions of the zero and ones. I think they have really hurt us over time. Now, just to clarify, here we have a couple of computers. Now, the one on the right, uh, obviously, uh, maybe some of you have seen some of the uh, videos on YouTube of uh, Asian students using uh, Abakai and then doing the Abacus calculations just using their fingers at incredible rates of speed. Now, in this case, uh, there's 13 columns, so we're good to 13 decimal points. Now, on the analog one on the left, well, are we going to get to 13 decimal points? No, we're going to get to an approximation that is good enough. It was good enough to get us to the moon. It was good enough to get us uh, nuclear weapon designs. It has been good, was good enough in the 1930s, 40s for all of the work that had led to pre-digital work. That's how it was done. And it was good enough. So part of what we have to keep in our mind as we're looking at alternative ways of security is what is good enough. And that's going to come into risk and trust. Uh, the Antikythera machine on the left, clearly an analog device of some degree of precision. And then the Enigma on the right, clearly a digital one-for-one -one binary relationship between input and output. And back in the day, uh, the big machine on the left, uh, that's a guidance system. And on the right, that was in uh, the early ENIAC. So we had both technologies uh, in parallel until roughly the early 1970s when digital cost of transistors had gone down by, oh God, nine orders of magnitude, and it became the way to go. I'm not saying it's right for security. Analog computers offer uh, some advantage if you're willing to live with a little bit less precision, if you don't need 10 decimal points, 12 decimal points, or six, or whatever the resolution is of your analog versus digital world. One of the advantages is speed, uh, lack uh, much lower power consumption, much more eco-friendly, and you can interface with the outside world, the physical world, much easier because you're already operating with sensors in a analog domain. Plus, we don't have as much noise that gets involved in the system. We're not going to have ADAC quantization noise that's going to be occurring. So we're going to have much more pure signals. Again, this is all within the analog realm. And the analog realm says, I have a minimum, I have a maximum, and everything is going to all of my answers. Everything is going to be somewhere in the middle. It's not going to be a zero. And it's not going to be a one. It's never going to be perfect. And as long as we can start thinking that way, we can arrive at some answers that are a little bit different. So the premises of the security, it's not working. I'm not going to go down that. The next generation stuff we see at RSA, eh, that's not going to do much. Digital is not binary. This binary mindset uh, that we see so much, especially today, it's an either or condition. And I have always been a huge fan because of my analog uh, growing up in engineering of spectrums of light. It's a spectrum, the visible light spectrum, uh, the electromagnetic spectrum, DC to light, whatever phrase you want to use. These are spectrums, the autism spectrum. It's not a binary condition. And when we look at things as simple politically as a minimum wage, uh, Congress will say, oh, we're going to make it $10. But where is the dynamics involved in that in order to have it evolve without having to have another huge pissing match in five or 10 years? Why not create a dynamic analog for that? So the survival mechanism and part of the problem that we have with our current networks and network security models is that the adaptability, the change, uh, is not really there. We have built these binary fortress mentality walls around things, and we're sort of stuck right there. And as you will see, the uh, really bad word is infinity. So if you remember the old joke, uh, there's two guys out hunting, and suddenly, and they're together, and suddenly there's a bear, and one guy starts running. 
The other guy sits down on a rock and he takes off his hunting shoes and starts to put on his Nikes. And the first guy is running away, says, what are you doing? What are you doing? You can't, you're not going to outrun the bear. And he goes, I don't need to outrun the bear. I just have to outrun you. And this is, again, an example of the min-max conditions of survivability that exist in the real world that, I argue, should be viewed as how we do things in uh, the world of security. So some of the things, uh, the, the philosophies that I, I talk about is uh, creating dynamics, making sure that we're not having uh, absolute static answers to things. And one of the ways to do that, as I'll show you in a bit, is by introducing various types of feedback mechanisms and out-of-band communications. Uh, we're not going to get into too much of negative time today, but it's another one of the elements that can be introduced into analog security and analog processing when we're trying to approach uh, one, which is 100% security, which will never be achievable, of course. So the whole thing, all of these pieces, the one common metric between them all is time. And time is allows us to have that uh, dynamic. And if you look at, again, quantum mechanics, unless there is a relationship between A and B, and there is some relative motion or relative activity going on between them, there is no activity. There is no progress at all. So therefore, we cannot live in the world of stasis. We have to keep things dynamically going. And this goes back, uh, Spaff referenced it. Uh, time-based security, and this was uh, some work that we did in the late 90s, and fundamentally it says, um, I should be able to know the detection time of a given thing. So uh, if we think of a jewelry store, and there are alarm systems and windows and all that, if I break the window, how long does it take the alarm system to detect that something bad has happened? That's detection time. Then we have RT, reaction time. What is the mitigating action? And in that case, it's probably a call to the police, send them all. Now, the bad guys are going to know if they've done their job right, how long it takes the police normally to be able to respond. So therefore, in this case, we have a DT, detection time plus reaction time equals exposure time. And that exposure time is how long the bad guys have to be able to steal as much jewelry as they can with whatever buffer time they think is appropriate prior to the police, if they're on time, coming to get them. That's all great and that makes things pretty simple. Now where the problem is for our world is vendors and it's PT, protection time or defense time. When you talk to a vendor and you say, hey, uh, how long can your, pick them on a firewall, defend against the entire Chinese cyber army before it collapses? Does anybody know that answer? No. Uh, is your, uh, are you going to guarantee your defensive product, whatever kind of defensive protective uh, product you have? Are you going to guarantee it? No, it doesn't happen. When we look at the efficacy of products that are out there, having a deterministic value of what that protection mechanism is, is not forthcoming right now in our industry. So I label it indeterminate. It could be really good, it could be really bad, it could be completely configured properly, or it could be completely misconfigured with massive holes in it. Again, a dynamic process. And we do not know the answer because the only way to know the answer is to go in and look. And we're not doing a whole hell of a lot of that right now. So the goal, assuming that we don't know what the value of protection is from any protective mechanism process in any of our networking. And this is good for human, kinetic, or cyber. The principle is the same. The goal is, because I don't know PT, is to make my detection and reaction time shrink and approach zero. It's a simple limit function. I want to get those periods of time as short as possible, because that also reduces my exposure time, which means that the bad guys of the jewelry store, uh, how much can they steal in one second uh, versus how much can they steal in 100 seconds or 1,000 seconds? There are some numbers there if we choose to look at it that way. Now, this gets much more interesting when we look at data exfiltration of the network at that bottom formula, because suddenly bandwidth becomes interesting as well, because bandwidth is another time function. So how much data can be extricated 
in what period of time based upon what bandwidths are, in, are part of the exfiltration pathing? Do we know that answer? Well, we should be able to analyze that answer and have some idea of what's going on. But this is the basis of time-based security, is that we want detection and reaction to approach zero, minimize exposure time under the auspice that we do not know for sure how good the protective mechanisms are. So part of, and I apologize why some of these uh, pictures are, because I swapped machines is why, I'm sorry, is putting feedback into mechanisms is one of the ways that I see of being able to actually apply quantitative analog uh, trust and risk into the design of the security of our networks. So if you look at the uh, picture with the brass there, that is a mechanical governor. And the purpose of that mechanical governor is to keep trains from not going too fast. And so the pressure at the bottom coming from the steam engine would force those balls to go out and it was encased in a, in a cylindrical tube. And therefore the phrase balls to the wall meant that your train was really going fast, forcing the balls to the wall, which was the feedback mechanism in order to try to slow it down a little bit. Otherwise you have a runaway condition and a runaway condition is an attempt to reach infinity. Now we have the same thing over here on, a, on an electrical, oh, my bad. There we go, sorry. Uh, we have the electrical condition. Every single electronic circuit in the world uses feedback. The reason it uses feedback is that without negative feedback, you're going to have runaway conditions electrically, period. End of story. Again, approaching infinity, as we see in the acoustic world down there. We've all seen speakers and microphones, and they start squealing. That is an attempt of that system to reach infinity. So without the negative feedback, we are going to have a self-reinforcing network that will cause bad things to happen. So all of this is about how do I control an analog system? And it's been done for a long time in the SCADA ICS world. Uh, we have this, we have the mindset. How high should the water go? Uh, how low can the water go? What temperature can the water be? What pressure can I have in the system? And these are all cyber kinetic interconnections in order to make systems work within tolerable limits. Again, min-max conditions. What are the tolerable limits of a particular system that I can live with that are good enough for my particular application without attempting to go completely binary? So we have these all around us. We live with them every single day. And we're going to see more and more of them, <clears throat> excuse me, in the coming years as uh, various types of neural networks and quote-unquote intelligence starts reaching out into more consumer products. Now, when we take the concept of feedback, I want to introduce this concept of OODA, and this was introduced by Colonel John Boyd in 1984 at Montgomery Air Force Base in Alabama, and he was a combat uh, pilot, and he theorized, what is the best way for me to survive and win in a dogfight? And the answer was an OODA loop. And his premise was the first portion is as a fighter pilot, observe. Now that could be through his sensors, biosensors. It could be through uh, the sensors in uh, the airplane itself. Some com combination of these create an observable frame of reference. Once you have that, then you have to orient. How do you, how do you fit inside this frame of reference with regards to the static items and then the dynamic items, which is gonna be your adversary. So you've got the orientation and then you have to make a decision. What are you gonna do? You're gonna to pull to the left, pull to the right, you're gonna shoot, what are you gonna do? And that's all based upon your observation and orientation. Once the decision is made, then you act and then you get to do it all over again, assuming you haven't been shot down, hopefully. So the OODA loop is a process and it's a process of control. Uh, we use the same thing in uh, marketing. Uh, I got an idea for a product. Well, let me do a little bit of research and see what people think of me building a whole new uh, green furry things. 
and I do market research. Turns out people really want green furry, furry things. I've done it all. I've oriented it to my satisfaction that it's worth a million dollars to invest. I make the decision to do that. We start manufacturing them and distributing them under ACT. They go out there and now I get to do more market research and find out, God, people didn't want green furry things. They want red furry things. And I have to go through this whole loop all over again. And the goal is in marketing, especially, it's very obvious. I want to do that faster than my competitor, because if I can react to market conditions and come out with what the market demands faster than my competitor, I have a better chance of winning. And this was Boyd's principle. And his whole point about dog fighting, he wants his OODA loop to be faster than his adversary's OODA loop, because if you are faster and inside of your adversary's OODA loop, you will win the battle. And that has been his argument. And it makes so much sense when we start looking at any dynamic system whatsoever. We can get really complex if we choose. There's all sorts of levels, and we see more of this as it applies into networks as well. Uh, one of the cases where positive feedback is good, and I just want to make sure that uh, is there, is when it comes to learning, because the learning in the neurals of our bio of the of the wetware up here is very similar to the learning mechanisms that we're attempting to do with uh, digital circuits, with electronic circuits, and emulating them in various other uh, artificial environments. So positive feedback does have mechanisms and it also it tends to be more in the bio area. And if you look at uh, life and growth and forest and all of that, positive feedback is exceedingly important. But for our purposes, we want negative feedback in the process. Now, let's take this and apply it a little bit more to uh, networks about trust. And I certainly have trust issues. Do I trust anybody 100%. Do you trust anybody 100%? Do you trust your spouse? And your gut reaction may be, um, yeah, I trust my spouse. I've asked audiences about this all around the world. And they go, yeah, yeah. And I said, all right, so you trust your spouse 100% with your life. And they go, yeah. And I said, what if your children were in danger? Would your wife, your spouse pick the children or you? He goes, yeah, but that's, I said, yeah, but that's an analog case. It is not binary because none of us know for sure how we're going to react in any situation. Now, when it comes to, in this case, uh, hiring people inside of an organization, and I'm not going to go down to code, I'm going to talk about people here. When we hire people, the HR departments uh, typically are so clueless as to what's important. And so I, I got together with some uh, friends that Spaff and I all know and said, G give me some ideas, give me some balance on what sort of criteria you're interested in when hiring somebody for <clears throat> a reasonably uh, important, mission critical, if uh, necessary, uh, security position. And these are the sorts of numbers. But each one then has a weighting factor. I really, really care about his technical competence. Yep, matters a whole lot. And I'm going to give it a weighting factor of 75% because it is that important to me. And so we have all of these uh, numbers that we're kind of guessing. We're kind of giving it a first pass guess to be able to come at uh, arrive at a uh, an approximate, comfortable trust level versus risk, because risk comes as a result of trust or non-trust. And so we can go through all of the weighting factors, but keep in mind that weighting factors, as I'll show you in a little bit, also change over time. These are not static. That's what happened to Aldrich James. That's what happened to Hanson. Nobody ever revetted them. It was like, okay, you're cool, you're cool. We're going to ignore the million dollars. We're going to ignore all this stuff where we never even noticed it. And this gets into what I'll show you later is detection and depth, which is that periodic trust reevaluation that can only be done through various types of uh, detection mechanisms. And again, we end up with trust factors sitting somewhere between zero and one. It's never going to be absolutely perfect. So, Let's uh, take a, a look at the two-man rule, and I, I want to concentrate on humans because it makes it easier here. Uh, typically, you've got in any uh, uh, environment some number uh, greater than one of people that have administrative control over 
all are pieces of the elements of your network. Cool. Now, what happens when you have, in this case, two people that have control over a particular portion of the network? Now, Alice and Bob here could be code, it could be process, but it's easier to think of it as humans. So let's say through our uh, trust evaluation, we're going to say both Bob and Alice have a trust level of 0.9, and that's going to work within my organization. It may not be translatable to Bank of America or the government or any other environment, but it's my self-contained universe that I've come up with these numbers to have some level of consistency. What happens if I now give them both the rights? What ends up happening is that because of prob probability, and I'll show you how this works, our overall trust factor decreases from 0.9 to 0.81. And this is pure probabilistic view of how risk and trust work in any network whatsoever. So using an OR gate in this case is going to absolutely degrade the performance uh, or my, my, the, uh, my confidence in my security. So let's look at it another way. Now we've got four people, all with OR, equal value of uh, trust. They're all 0.9s. What happens? Suddenly, there's the math. Suddenly, the overall trust that I can apply to that particular portion of my network goes way the hell down. So the math is there. It's pretty straight ahead. But this isn't the solution that I'm looking for. So the two-man rule says, I want both Bob and Alice to confirm an action, whatever that action is, whatever that decision is. So. When we do that, we've got a, a different equation that comes up, and it comes out when Bob and Alice both approve that particular action, our trust factor has suddenly increased substantially, and there's the digital equivalent in a switching network. The problem is time. How long does it take Bob to verify Alice? It could take a minute. It could take a weekend. It could take some period of time. In processes and code, then it's in a different set of equations, but the principle is still the same. So in this case, this is what we're seeing here is just not going to work. And this is the way my wife's car works. So take a look at this. It's pretty straight ahead. She has one of those auto sensing cars. And so you're driving along and you want to change lanes. Now, in the old days, what I would do is I do this, I'll do that, flip the thing, maybe double check if I'm a good driver or if it's really crowded before I change lanes. Now, with these auto sensing cars, there's uh, an increase in uh, a tendency for people to trust the technology. <clears throat> and I know a lot of us don't like that phrase. So what my wife's car does, she clicks to turn, uh, switch lanes, See, put on the blinker, that activates all these sensors. And do you trust it? Do I just change lanes because the computer and the car says it's safe? Or do I do this anyway as a verification that there's not a Porsche coming down at 200 miles an hour in the next lane gonna hit me because the sensors are only good for 50 meters? What do I do? Well, in this case, how much time do you need to do that double verification before you actually change lanes? And this is the principle of what is called a time-based flip-flop, which is the basis of all analog security. And what you see down there uh, in the, uh, well, sorry, in the upper right is, is a, a, an abstract version of how uh, decision matrices are done, uh, regardless of what the environment is. But down in the lower right, this is the time-based flip-flop, which basically says, Alice is going to make a decision. Policy, company policy is going to give Bob one minute, one day, some period of policy-driven time to approve or disapprove Alice's choice. However, if Bob does not react within that policy amount of time decrementation, then the original decision that Alice made will be revoked. 
And this is a pretty straight ahead thing. You can, you can do a one over X decision matrix too. It's the same thing. The logic is the same. You're just flipping your, uh, your outputs and decisions. This says, I want all of my two man rule decisions or three or four, doesn't matter. It's the logic is the same to occur within a certain period of time with a certain level of confidence based upon the trust. And then there's the uh, truth table that comes out of this, which starts giving us some additional insights into what we're doing. Now, part of the thing that occurs here, and I don't expect you to get all of this immediately, and that's why it'll be uh, made available, is if you notice the yellow uh, in the right, what I'm doing is uh, increasing the decrementing time. So I'm doing it in the upper left from one second, then down to 100 seconds, down to 700 seconds. And when we throw all the math at it, what ends up happening is you can look at the re risk reduction in the lower right cell. And the risk reduction goes way the hell up when my time is small. When my time is big, my risk reduction is not nearly as good at all. So this is part of the mechanism that we can use to find out how well am I really doing when I plug numbers into the equation? So now we get back to the vendor question. How good are these vendor products? Well, in this case, I'm going to pick a uh, malware detection mechanism because it's easy. And I view most stuff in networks as being black boxes because 99.99% of the time, we have no idea what's going on inside of these things at all. We no clue what is going on. So treat it as a black box. So what I have been suggesting and getting some people to do is a black box, we know how it should look under normal operating conditions. So I can get an input and I can get an output and everything is straight at now. It should be able to detect some known samples of badness, code badness. All right, what I want to do then is inject that in to the good data stream, start a clock, and wait for the black box to tell me I saw something. I saw something bad. Question is, how long did that take? Why don't we know this answer contextually from our vendors? Well, the vendors I've spoken to don't like the question because it shows some drastic differences in performance between them. And then we can extrapolate all of this, of course, into the right to include reaction matrices and the reaction process where we start another clock to say, okay, I've got my detection that occurred in X period of time, or it's T1 minus T0 time as per the first detection out of the black box. Do the same thing for reaction. Reaction uh, can be defined as full mitigation, shutdown, turn off, whatever you are satisfied with is the answer from a corporate policy standpoint. So we understand how to do this, but what we need is also to start measuring all of this stuff. And then we've got this thing that uh, has been over the years, it's been called, I'm gonna have two products do the job. I'm gonna buy one for fee and I'll pay the subscription fee. The other one is gonna be free. And between the two of them, I should be all right. Well, yes and no. It depends how you configure it. If you configure them, any mechanisms that are doing this at, with an OR gate and saying, oh, if either one detects it, I'm good, you're going to end up with lower reliability, lower efficacy of the operation of that particular black box. What you need to do is the same thing that we did with the two-man rule is and them, they both need to detect it in order to have a high confidence factor that the output in this case is gonna trigger something prop uh, properly. Now, how do we do this? Uh, we actually do some of this right now. Um, I, I wanna do something on my bank and it's gonna say, you really can't do this until uh, you, we verify who you are. So there's a pause that goes on. I get an out of band communication to me that says, uh, here's a code. I have X period of time to enter it based upon the bank sets RT policy up there. Go, no go decision, and it moves on. So we're doing some of this right now, but we can do better than this. What about with phishing? Same sort of thing. Uh, there are inventories and repositories of full phishing everything. Who's good? Who's bad? Reputation. Same thing. Before you actually send something before you click on something, 
we can do the same thing. We can say pause, halt, let's take a look, do an analysis, do the risk analysis or trust analysis of what that link is, what that particular operation is, and create a go, no go condition based upon the policy decision. Same mechanism. Now, some criticism says, oh, you're gonna interrupt user experience. Well, we, you know, we can go through databases pretty damn fast. We, if you're looking at a couple hundred milliseconds, we're below real sensory threshold for most human detection that's meaningful. It might be a little jerk, but this is where we need to amplify the encouragement of vendors to be able to increase performance so that we do actually have a measurable increase in uh, the, uh, the security of our networks. Uh, how about uh, data exfiltration? Same thing, the same model exists. Before we send out stuff, what do I not want to send out? That's policy. Uh, I don't want to send out XLSs. Uh, I don't want to send out files that say human resources. Whatever the list is, this goes back to an SMTP sort of detection filtering mechanism before the data is actually allowed or out of the organization. And this is something that people will not notice at all because this is on the output. We always say the up speed doesn't matter as much as down speed because the humans aren't going to notice it. Cool. Let's take that same approach and see if this will actually work. And there's different models. Is Alice going to check her own work? Is Bob going to check Alice's work? And again, the same circuits are going to work in any of these types of models. Now, I keep mentioning that this is about time. It's about everything is going to change over time and trust degrades over time by definition. How do I know that in one year you are as trustworthy as you were today unless I have know everything that you have done, every conversation you have ever had? How do I know all of this? Well, I can make some assumptions. And again, these are initial assumptions that have to be made. And that's the same way that Bayes probability works as well. You have to make some initial assumptions and get the system tuned up. Now, trust degradation can occur in three ways, linear, exponential, or logarithmic. And Keep in mind, as your trust goes down over whatever period of time it is, your risk starts going up. And again, there's that ugly symbol there, infinity. So when we start looking at trust factors, and I'm using 0.9 as the reference one that we were earlier, on the upper left, uh, what we're doing is saying, in our policy model, if we can retrust, uh, sorry, revet the same event, the same condition, the same decision, over and over again, we're gonna raise our baseline of trust for that. Cool. Uh, in the middle, we're looking at the dynamics of time over trust factor. And this, in, the, in this case, it's a simple uh, linear uh, degradation of trust over time based upon a, perhaps a guess that I wanna revet uh, Bob every 30 days, every 90 days, whatever those criteria are, which would trigger, trigger the revetting, and based upon assuming that it's a good revet, would increase uh, the trust factor way back up linearly. And so these are different ways of looking at these problems. Now, when we get into the granularity and the precision that we often need when an organization has a billion emails or more going in and out of an organization on a yearly basis, we're dealing with a whole mess of uh, decimal points. So I, I made up and came up with another way to look at it, just using another nomenclature, so we don't have to deal with all of the damn nines that are going to be inherent in a very well, very fine-tuned analog detection and reaction network. And that brings up detection and depth. The reason planes don't crash is because engine technology, in this particular one, uh, there's over 5,000 sensors that in real time are activating their internal network with once a second updated information. Like the human brain, we are designed to survive. We are designed to predict the future, which allows us to survive. The same model occurs in detection and depth. Yet detection and depth is still not part of the vernacular of our world because defense and depth, but if you can't measure the defense, what are you doing? So. The bottom there is a two-layer defensive uh, in uh, defense in depth network, taking a simple TBS formula, showing that the same process can occur for all of the subcomponents, no matter how deep we go within the environment. Same thing, then you apply it to OODA loop. 
how many layers of depth do I want to have? So on the left, what have I got? I got three layers of depth uh, for each of the decisions that are being made. Is this code? Is it human? Is it operational? It doesn't matter. Abstractly, the principle is the same. And then when we start talking about adding neural and AI-ish sort of things into it, it starts to look a little bit more like the uh, drawing on the right. So how do you win this thing? This is how you win it. We have to be able to measure our detection and our reaction. We have to be able to anticipate and understand what our adversaries are doing, what they're capable of doing, and start modeling this mathematically. We understand that according to Boyd, and I buy into it, and I think it's common sense, so if we can argue this, is that if you were inside of your adversary's decision loop, you're gonna win. You're gonna win. We understand the math. We understand how to do an awful lot of these things. And just what's not been done is a whole heck of a lot of prototyping. I'm working on one prototype of another application for limiting D DDoS at tier one networks. This is another type of prototype that would uh, need to be done. So what can be done now? Uh, we can measure most of this stuff. We can do this right now. Yet for whatever reasons, we have chosen not to. Is it too hard? Is it too much of a rethink? Are the vendors really going to hate it? Because right now, A to A, Apple to Apple comparisons between vendors is so absurdly hard, and they're all throwing more and more buzzwords at us. But where is the efficacy? Where is the proof of it all? I return then to my axioms, which I'll ask you to read at another time. And that's great because I'm not going to read the whole sl slide. Please buy my book. Go get my other books. They're all for free out there. If you really want to dig deep into the math behind all this thing, these are the fundamental formulas. I'll get my math guy, uh, Dr. Mark Carney, uh, to work with you if you want to really dig into it and start uh, playing with this stuff. Uh, if you're interested in a cheat sheet on uh, all of these formulas, how they work, how they interact, and some basics on Bayesian probabilistics and how uh, they tie into all of this, uh, I'll, I'll be happy to just drop me an email and I'll be happy to send it to you. And uh, that's the end of it. I am done and I was told to have 10 minutes left and I have 10 minutes left. Uh, thank you, Wynn. Um, 10 minutes, of course, being... Uh... A relativistic time there so <laughs> we we appreciate that there's a lot of material that you packed into that talk that i think for some of our attendees uh may not be immediately clear but the book uh time-based security does lay this out in greater detail and presents the math of it analog, analog network security our analog network security. Well, you've got the time-based security. Time-based security gives the, all the basic frameworks that then lead up to what the analog network security did. Yeah. Yep. So we have two questions in the Q and A for you to uh, perhaps look at and give us an answer. Yeah, cryptanalysis, probabilistic. Sure, it's time-based. Absolutely. Uh, anything that has time as its fundamental component, cryptanalysis. Uh, how, how good? That's why we're going through it now. Quantum crypto, post-quantum crypto, how long does it take to, and if they're looking at the world really very well in this case, making sure that they've got the proper tamper-proof detection mechanisms, uh, a proper reaction uh, protocol built into it. And again, I would refer uh, you to Dr. Mark Carney, who is doing a tremendous amount of work in QKD in this area. But yes, uh, if some of you may recall back in uh, 76 or 77, uh, NIST at that point, or and NIST, no, National Bureau of Standards became NIST, and they uh, approved DES to uh, secure crypto stuff or banking or whatever. And then along came Deep Think or something, Deep Crack, and that was in the early 90s, and it was a homebrew project uh, to crack it, and it was cracked within 24 hours. And then all of these periods uh, that occur with whether it's ECC or any type of crypto, they're all subject to some sort of time-based function. So yeah, I fully agree with that. Time-dependent security relative to the gravity well happens to be in. Yes, um, it absolutely does. If you're sitting on the Schwarzschild radius of any black hole at all, uh, yes, uh, this entire formula completely collapses due to the simultaneity of the inanity of that question. 
<laughs> Thank you, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay. If the security solution can't see the threat, how do you model these timings? That's what, one of the things that hackers have been saying for 30 years. Think like a bad guy. If you're only thinking like a good guy, don't even bother playing. Don't play. Uh, if you're thinking like a good guy and you open a jewelry store, you're not going to have an alarm system. Uh, you have to think like a bad guy. you got to stay up on top of all of the the noise out there with the hacker community with black cat with all of the zero all of this that you got to stay on top of it absolutely and the time-based modeling of it is something that i hope becomes uh more of a common way of examining the problem but it's not there yet but yeah you got to stay on top of all this crowd strikes planted the dnc evidence i have no idea i don't even uh, i no nah, that's not i don't live there sorry Simon, uh, companies don't. I'm not sure what that actually meant. But, uh, okay, relatives expense, even more security, two more people. You see if one of them is dead. Yeah, of course. Yeah, Richard, that, no, that's absolutely right. And that's why it's all about risk. And I'm just turning it upside down because this industry, we've had one hell of a hard time coming up with how do you, how do you measure risk? Because there are so many assumptions in there. And uh, I've seen the formulas, risk equals temperature times gravity well times number of people divided by emails. I mean, you, you read all these various risk formulas, and but they, they never grapple with hard math. They're very uh, amorphous and vaporous, which is why I went over to Rick, uh, it's over to trust models. Look at trust. Are we going to get an absolute answer? That's part of the issue. No, you're not going to get an absolute answer, but you have a hell of a lot better control over arriving at an approximation for you to begin with because you have other criteria. It's not a binary criteria. I trust you. I risk you or whatever. There's lots of sub criteria with lots of weighting and that ends up mirroring the way the brain works and neural uh, and networks are working. They don't follow what the black cats do. It's why I infiltrate. Okay, <laughs> then infiltrate away. Uh, again, that's not something that I do. I, I think about you infiltrators and how long it takes you to do it, but I, I do not infiltrate anymore. Yeah, I think that was in response to, uh, or an expansion on this first one where you said companies don't saying companies don't follow what the black hats do. Uh, they don't follow, I mean, the research on it, well, there's a, you, mean, you mean they don't stay up to speed on what's going on? Uh, I didn't ask the question, I'm just. Okay. I, I think it's more about, you know, not understanding the, the black hats, you know, people. Well, then uh, that, that's a fundamental cultural problem that, I can't help you with. It's like, here's what you got to do. I'm not the only one. That's, this has been the same message for 30 years. So, uh, yep. All right. Our evil has been marauding across the globe. Let's see. What, what are they doing now? We seem to be focused on protection strategies. What do you think will take to shift into an offensive mode? I don't think I can answer that really quickly at all. I think I would need to think upon that. Um, the you got to look at the common attack vectors. The attack vectors are don't change based upon the payload. Uh, this goes back to what we were talking, Gene, what, 30 years ago with information warfare. Uh, you, you can examine an awful lot of uh, these types of attacks, and each one is going to have its individual payload and object of the, of the attack. Uh, so they're all payload independent, but they are very vector intrusive dependent. And I think the last number I heard was 92% of them all begin with some level of social engineering. I don't know, 70, probably something like that. And then it's going to be behavioral analysis over a stolen identity in a, in a network. Um, I don't think that changes uh, absolutely uh, anything I'm saying here. It's a different way of looking. And detecting. We don't do a whole lot of individual endpoint detection to the level that I would like to see. And part of that is a political cultural problem. And part of it is a resource problem because that can eat up a bunch of, uh, a bunch of bandwidth that you're at your endpoint, especially with all the mobile ones. 
Uh, okay, no coin, but very interesting how the math actually proves the need for segregation of duties. How we're gonna, oh, thank you, Kalen. Thank you, appreciate that. It's about bad people, not bad code. Um, I would argue that bad code can be designed by good people. Uh, errors. Um, how many organizations have a specialist that whose entire job you're going to give them? Here's 50,000 lines of code. There's two semicolons out of place. Go find them. What kind of person does that? Somebody on the spectrum will really help because they love those kinds of problems. That's a perfect problem for them, yet they'll never get through HR. And then this brings me down the whole hiring the unhirable thing, which is another set of equations. But we have the tools if we chose to use them in many cases. Well, good. Um, the rest are just sort of comments. And we've pretty much hit the end of our time here. Um, when I'd like to invite you to come back uh, to, well, actually visit in person at Purdue sometime uh, in the not too distant future, because it would be great to have you here in person giving another talk and being able to interact in person with some of the people here. I want to have some real arguments. Let's go out afterwards and drink beers and cheap French red wine and argue. All right, that sounds like a great plan. I'll uh, buy the first round for whoever comes. But for this today, thank you so much for oh, thank the time. You. And um, uh, if anybody else has other questions, Wynn has his uh, email address there, you can ask him. And we're continuing to do this uh, through July, having a weekly seminar. You're welcome to continue to join. And again, we have all, uh, many, many years, decades worth of these talks recorded on our website. So uh, thank you all for attending and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you, appreciate it.